Hello, everyone. <laughs> Please grab a seat, and we can get started as soon as everyone's settled. Um, I'm Barbara Sturgis Everett, and I'm on the Contemporary Issues Committee. And I would like to welcome um, Darnell, our Director of Music, but also our um, speaker this morning. And Darnell, we are very excited about getting to hear you, and, and you can introduce the people you've brought with you. Thank you very much, Barbara. I'm uh, very honored to be invited to speak on this occasion. It's my first time speaking publicly in this way, and I'm very happy that it's happened at my home church of First Congregational. So thank you to the committee. Thank you uh, to Pastor, Senior Pastor Still, uh, Reverend Livingston, and to all of you who have stayed after the service um, on this wintry day, even in the midst of COVID. Um, I won't be before you very long. I want to honor and thank my friend and brother, Ken Nixon for being among us. He's uh, celebrating what I call a birthday soon um, on the anniversary of his exoneration, which will be February the 18th. And he's gonna talk with us today and help me answer some of the questions that are far beyond my ability. He also traveled to Africa on mission within this calendar year. Amazing, yes, he's an international traveler already. And he is a national speaker on issues of injustice and exoneration. He's also a university student. All this in one year, yes. Um, so I'm very honored that he is with us on today. Um, I tried to prepare a program that would try to capsulate uh, my work in terms of the doctoral studies at Pacific School of Religion, which I have 47 days to hand in my <laughs> doctoral capstone. And then I'll defend on April the 14th. These dates are etched and be hopefully graduating uh, in May. And all of this is part of my doctoral work. Most of it will be in the form of media. So I have prepared some media for you on today. And in the words of Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays, I only have just a minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give an account if I abuse it, just a minute, but eternity is in it. And I, I, that is the story of my life. My life is but a vapor. I only got a minute here and I need to do something with it. Um, my time with you is very short. So I'm hopeful that uh, the, the, the media will help to expedite and accentuate the three points that I would like to entertain in terms of our questions on today. The, third, the first point is this, these are real people, flesh and blood. They have value. The third point is you can make a difference. If you can leave with just those three points, I think I will have done what I need to do in this minute, which is my life in this time, in this moment. These are real people. They have value. You can make a difference. You can help make a difference. Thank you so much, Jared and Stephan. If you would please roll it, I thank you. Hello, I am Darnell Ishmael, and I would like to introduce you to the work of Notes from the Village. Trigger statements and questions. What are the first images that come to mind when you hear the words prison, mass incarceration, and American penal system? Have you ever known someone who was in prison? The rapid growth in recent decades of the inmate population in America is unjust. After 15 years in prison with good behavior, prisoners should be able to be granted weekend passes. 
Um, what do you think, Darnell? What do I think in terms of reforming yeah, American prisons to reflect the, pro the progress we see in other countries? There you go. Let's start with that. Um, I'm, I'm trying to be hopeful. <laughs> um, uh -huh. It won't happen until enough people with a strong moral center really come together um, here in America and change our minds and our thoughts collectively about what prisons are. Um, prisons are a reflection of, in America, prison is a, a reiteration of American slavery. It's slavery mm. by a different name. And even to reform it means that I am reforming and reshaping prison and it's slavery. It's you're, reform, you're reforming slavery. Um, I believe prisons in America need to be abolished. I believe that needs to be a long-term a long-term plan that happens in my lifetime. Yeah. A nice. long-term plan that happens in my lifetime. It needs to be abolished because even reforming, it means that we're reforming some system of slavery here in America. Um, other countries have figured out what to do in terms of rehabilitation and reintegration. Um, and in America, people don't want to admit it, but it's it really is about money in in capitalism. Um, these so, states, and these communities make money on on prisons and black bodies and brown bodies. They make money in warehousing bodies. I've been uh, engaged with uh, the incarcerated since 2011 now, and I couldn't imagine myself doing this work. I, the Lord brought me to it, and now it's been almost 10 years. But I've not seen any substantive change since I started this journey. I've not seen any wholesale uh, overhaul. I've not seen any strong first world type of progress being made in areas of reform of the system, mm -hmm. reentry services, uh, rehabilitation. I've not seen it. And I have their testimonies. The, the, over, the Notes from the Village is uh, the website. That's www.nftv.online. We, 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 put, we put their stories on, on this website. We also use YouTube as an outlet. Brothers will call in and they'll tell us what's going on. And we record those phone calls with their permission and their knowledge, and we post it and we share that information. So it's their testimony. This is a prepaid call from a prisoner at the American Department of Corrections. Yeah, hello, Darnell. Hey, I am yeah. uh, driving right now, but it is recording. So if you are ready, I will yeah. uh, put myself on mute and I will allow you to just record and then I'll be able to listen to it later on. Okay. I could do All that. Right. Yep. All right, you are now on mute. Hello, yes. My name is Chad Smith, and I am currently housed at the Gus Harrison Correctional Facility on a probable cause to hold for a possible parole violation. And I have been here for three whole years without proper legal action in a timely manner in accordance with my legal due process. The facts of the case are as follows. I was the target of a robbery on my street. I fled from a car of several robbers seeking help from anyone available in my neighborhood area on the scene. The police was called, and I was mistaken for a suspect in accordance to accusations of an alleged crime of a supposed carjacking happening, which later turned out to not be the case. This took place on August 3rd, 2018, in the city of Romulus, Michigan, which ended with myself being shot several times by Romulus police, locking myself in the neighbor's home in hopes of preserving my young black life from the hands of the Romulus police officers who shot me several times with AR-15 assault-style military-grade rifles and several other artilleries, ultimately ended in alleged police standoff, which was just another young black man trying not to be killed by suburban police officers in his new neighborhood. So now I'm sitting in here in prison with 22 charges, including two counts of assault with intent to murder police officers, kidnapping, carjacking, home invasion, first degree, 10 counts of felony firearm, and a fourth degree habitual, which can be 25 to life sentence enhancement, and a number of several other outstanding charges 
All the cops involved had on body cams, but stated at the preliminary hearing, none of the body cams were on or recording at the time. That seems kind of strange. They are trying to bully me into taking a plea deal due to the fact that I cannot obtain the proper counsel for a high profile case like this. I would need in order to properly dispute this matter and see with all of the facts that no harm or any crime was intended on my part to anyone at any time in this matter. And I was a young black victim seeking help and instead almost losing my life at the hands of several confused, scared, suburban, trigger-happy cops. As a credentialed minister, a concerned taxpayer, and a person of color, I am troubled by the effects of mass incarceration on the seemingly seared conscience of America, particularly among people of faith. Does apathy and resignation scar one's spirit? I often wonder, what are the consequences of over-sentencing and wrongful convictions on the prophetic witness of the Christian faith? What is said of ourselves by our collective punishment of others? Do we know? Do we care? The modern-day theologian and much-celebrated writer, Walter Brueggemann, warns us that numbness robs us of our capability for humanity. It is clear to me that more people must get involved in helping to heal ourselves and our collective thoughts around judicial punishment and reform our system of community rehabilitation. Trigger statements and questions. The racial disparity within the inmate population in America is unjust. Are you and or your church currently engaged with prison abolition and justice reform? If so, why or why not? Have you personally ever visited a prison? The American penal system represents 400 plus years of slavery by another name. Okay, Darnell, go ahead. I just want to say this. I don't think that there will ever be change in American prison system until there is money on this side of the wall. What do I mean by that? It's not enough in America for us to say, oh, we'll save money if we do this with the prison. No, we Americans want to make money. So when there's opportunities for enterprise of them, being, and it just makes monetary sense, I don't know that our moral compass is going to turn because our moral compass is turned towards capitalism. So right. I, I think I just want to establish that as my own thought process. There's a, a, a profession called actuarial science, and they've they got people who are employed to run the statistics and find out how much are these bodies costing? How much do we make if we let this one go? How much do we make if we retain this percentage of those who would be paroled, et cetera. And they're making monetary decisions based on that actuarial science. To Amber's point about being uh, rotten to the core, um, when I was living in San Francisco, there was this restaurant downtown that made the sourdough bread and they've been making it that way for hundreds of years because they use the mother yeast from way back when and they save it. You've heard, you know, if you've heard oh, the yeah. legend of that. Well, the Quakers started the American prisons here, and they started it with a certain type of moral compass, a certain thing that was baked into it, and that's long been lost. Oh, it's see. not what it was from way back years and years ago. Trigger statements and questions. If you have never known an incarcerated person, what kind of stereotypes do you have in your mind about prisoners? and prison life. There is a clear, direct, and undeniable connection between those who were taken from the shores of Dakar, Senegal in 1490 and those who were snatched from the streets of Detroit, Michigan some 400 plus years later. If prison is slavery reformed, how then do we reform prison? and it not be a form of slavery. Everybody in prison ain't guilty, and everybody guilty ain't in prison.
Notes from the Village is an organization that filled the void within the prison system in Michigan. There's nobody that's, even if it's something simple, it's basic as passing along information. The information that you were giving us, even on the most basic of levels, tax information about stimulus checks, we weren't getting that. We weren't getting that, not from the state, not from our families, not from uh, lawyers, right? We were getting accurate information, up-to-date, real-time information from what you were delivering to us at a cost that you were able to cover out of your own pocket. I don't want to, I want to clarify in all transparency, I'm not a chaplain. I'm a lay person. Mm -hmm. I don't go in as a chaplain. I'm not connected to them as a chaplain. I'm connected as a lay person to over 250 guys and it grew from three. So what am I saying? You don't necessarily, I would, if some, if, if I was going to become a chaplain, if that was what God would, then I would, I would receive that and I would operate in that, in that space. But any person can do something is what, is what I think I'm saying. So I honor what you're doing, Dane. Um, you're going in there, that makes a difference. And in any kind of way that anyone in this faith space can show up in the life of an imprisoned person or an imprisoned population, even without the six-figure budget and all the staffing and all the pamphlets and handouts, without all of that, you will make a difference in, in the life of someone. Trigger statements and questions. After 20 years in prison with good behavior, at least 75% of lifers should be able to earn an early parole. What is the adjusted value of a human being before, during, or after incarceration? How could you become more aware of and more sensitive to this population. When it comes to sentencing, do you believe in retribution or rehabilitation? We must be willing to meet the moment. How do you turn a moment into a movement? We got to meet that moment. Mm -hmm. And we can't miss it. I think we missed a moment at the beginning of COVID. And we were not able to capture momentum. Certain things in life take momentum. It's not going to happen through muscularized power. It's going to have to be a momentum that happens. And if we meet the moment and don't miss it, the winds of change will blow for us and we'll capture that momentum and we will have turned that moment into a movement and things will change, hopefully in our lifetime. Yeah. But if not in mine, definitely in the generation behind me. Thank you for watching this video presentation. Just, I want to just restate how it's so important and significant that you're traveling. 
um, as an African American man going back to your ancestral homeland, being so recently freed and exonerated from what is basically reflective of 400 plus years of an American slave system. It's not lost on me the significance of you making this journey back home. Good afternoon. I am Darnell Ishmael, and I am appealing to you to support my, my permissions campaign. Everyone who knows me knows that I am not a person of, of great wealth. If you look at my bank account, it does not reflect a person of great wealth. I uh, live frugally most of the time from blessing to blessing, paycheck to paycheck, and I am paying my own expenses. And if you look on my page, you can see I'm doing it by Airbnb, very uh, low cost economically. And I mowed grass over the summer for the city of Flint, Michigan, and did some other types of projects in order to earn enough money to pay for a $700 airline ticket. And I did the same thing the last time when I went. Work, earned some money, and was able to even include other people in, in going. Not because I'm a person who has a six-figure income, because I don't. But I believe in the mission that God has, has, has given me, and that is to reach ex in an extended way out to those who are most marginalized and most in need. So this project, it reflects that. It reflects also um, my doctoral work at Pacific School of Religion. And I'm asking you to support. We have some missions happening there on the ground that are changing lives, literally. When a church, a real part of the country, needs a, a piano, and that piano is $500, and that is like two months net income for the average person who is working, that's an awful lot of money to have to come up with. But there are people here who can make that happen, and I'm so grateful for those who have, have made things happen. Book bags, hygiene products, micro loan financing, cross-cultural exchange, household goods, housing development, college scholarship and support, school supplies, poultry farm investment, starter kits for micro businesses, seed funds for micro entrepreneurs and there's a church in need of some building supplies simple things like concrete um they call them culverts they you, you you build them you put them into the ground and they help the help you to be, help the water to go underneath I, i'm not a field engineer i don't know all about it but the thing is like 35 us dollars and they need about 10 of them i'm like can we get some people on the here um that would love God enough, love humanity enough, uh, love at the spirit of ambition enough, um, and just love goodness enough to skip a dinner. Some people, you know, uh, skip a few uh, skip a few drinks uh, or whatever it is and, and just make that sacrifice. Um, there are some people that would be so grateful. I know I, I'd be very grateful. Um, and I will show you the difference that you're making. I will send you the video so that you can see how you are making a difference. Thank you for your support. Thank you for this time. And this is about four minutes, so I'm going to stop this video now. Be well. I want to thank you all for your uh, patience and your attentiveness to this uh, videos here. And I want to uh, yield some time to maybe answer some questions. That first video was really about triggering conversation. My hope is that uh, those video, the first video could be used in a way that will spur conversation among people. Um, so hopefully maybe you may have circled one of those questions. I don't know. 
the uh, second video was really to show you just a glimpse there's, uh, of what you have already been a part of as a church. Um, I came to Pastor Bob some months ago and I, I told him about this church over in Bungoma, Kenya, who literally, um, very literally, they worship in a sheet metal building. And out in the country, Ken was there. He saw this. And I saw, well, the pastor said that they needed to do some renovations. And I was like, Lord, I ain't got no money. But, uh, <laughs> and, but I told him, I'll, I'll take the petition to God. I'll take the petition to the people. And I'm thankful that this church is one of the very few who did respond. And there's a, a much longer video that really gives a fuller report. And you'll, you can see what just a couple thousand dollars, literally a couple thousand dollars, has moved the needle for an entire community. I mean, literally have moved tons of rock and sand and cement for this church that you saw worshiping there. Um, Ken is the only person in this room that can really answer questions about Africa and missions and being in the American prison system. So I'm very grateful for him being here with me on today. And I'm going to ask him to come at this time and, and maybe give a, a, just a, sh a short preface. And, and if we have any questions, uh, maybe 10 to 15 minutes for questions. And he's going to answer most of them. <laughs> hey everybody my name is kenneth nixon and i spent 15 years and nine months incarcerated for a crime that i didn't commit february 18th 2021 i was finally exonerated after my lawyers were able to prove that i was innocent um in a very short time yes i've accomplished everything that Darnell stated and probably a few other things that got left out. When I came home, there was, I guess you can just say it, sheer will and determination to help assist those that I'd left behind. And in doing so, I took from my own experience and I tried to address the needs of what I experienced, both inside and outside of prison. There was a part of that first video that really made me emotional. And a big part of what people don't understand is even after release, there's still no help. And what I mean by that is, I'll use the most recent exoneration as a perfect example. There was a guy released from prison after serving 16 years, just last Friday, not two days ago, last Friday. And yeah, big celebration. Everybody was happy this guy gets out of prison. It made the news. He didn't do it. We know he didn't do it. There was a mistake made. He's free now. And the story goes on, rides off into the sunset, right? The reality is that guy went to his sister's basement and he's sleeping on a box spring with no mattress, no underwear, no t-shirts, no toothpaste. The clothes he came home with was the only thing that he owned when he walked out of that prison. To make matters worse, my group of exonerees, we've started a tradition of when we find out that someone is being released, we go to the prison to receive that person. Because the MDOC has sent him seven hours away from Detroit, he was being released on a Friday. Wednesday and Thursday, we were having blizzard. Everybody around us advised us not to get on that freeway. The compromise, because MDOC was refusing to move him closer to home to be re released, 
the compromise was to put them up into a hotel at the MDOC's expense across the Upper Peninsula Bridge until the weather and the roads cleared up. We refused. He was a very close friend to, or he is, my apologies, to one of our other exonerees. So I get the phone call that this guy's being released and our advisors, I guess you can say, are advising us not to get on the road. My immediate response was, I don't care what they say. He's not going to a hotel. Eventually it worked out. It works out. The guy gets home and he comes home to nothing. Absolutely nothing. And I don't mean that in small letters, nothing. I mean that in all big letters. He came home to nothing. His family didn't have anything to offer him besides a place to stay. The people around him had nothing to offer him. But we as exonerees, knowing where he is, knowing where he just come from, we came together. We came together quickly because we understood the plight that he was stepping into. Nobody gets it because incarceration, criminal justice reform is one of those things where it's ignored until it touches somebody close to you. You look away from it because it's not necessary or it's unimportant to what you feel to be important. But the reality is there's flaws within the system, huge gaping flaws. Things get missed. People get overlooked. Tragedies happen. But the difference between criminal justice reform and most other industries are, is the decisions being made actually affect people. If a cop does something bad, somebody gets hurt. If that cop intentionally makes a bad decision, somebody goes to prison. The other end of that is that without the most recent efforts to bring awareness to criminal justice reform, there are still tons of people in this country that wouldn't even know this was happening. There's not a week that goes by that you don't see a headline where an innocent person is being released. That is a statistic. That is a fact. Sometimes it happens multiple times in the same week. The numbers on a yearly basis have increased for the last five to six years straight. We are now upwards of 150 people being released every year that have been wrongfully convicted. The years that people spend in prison for crimes that they didn't commit range anywhere from a few months to multiple decades in prison. That's a, it sounds, it sounds like not a big deal. But I did something recently that had a bigger effect than I realized. Instead of saying, I spent 15 years and nine months in prison with the advice of a very wise person, we chose to flip it. So instead of my shirt saying 15 years and nine months, it now says 5,607 days. 5,607 days is how much time I spent in prison. Now, mind you, I'm on the lower end of people within my organization. We've got a guy that did 43 years in prison. I don't even know how to calculate that many days. If he put that on the back of his shirt, I'd sit there like a moron, just staring at him, trying to do the math in my head. Because I don't know, like, how many days is that, right? Naturally, you're going to look for a calculator or a phone to try to figure that out. 
I mean, I don't know anybody can do it that fast in their head, but the shock value is the aim. The purpose is to get you to think about that for a second. There's only 365 days in a year, and he spent 43 years. I just saw him yesterday. That's what made me use him as an example. I saw him yesterday, and he looked at me like, hey, what's up, buddy? Yeah. Big difference on this side, right? <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's a really, really tough situation to be in. And the work that I've chosen to take on since coming home, a big part of what we do is try to bring awareness and visibility and knowledge to the conversation, firsthand knowledge. What I've learned and what I've discovered is you have rooms all over this country filled with highly educated people, very smart people, some of the best schools in the world that are making decisions for how the prison system should operate. But yet, they don't talk to the people that the prison system affects. You have all these highly educated, some Ivy League people, making decisions. And these decisions, you'll never see the consequences of those decisions. You'll never truly understand how that affects people. So what makes you feel like you're qualified to make that decision when you don't even know what it's going to look like on the other end? Who are you to say what the prison system should look like or how it should operate when you'll never actually see it? How can you know that that's the right decision when you'll never actually see it? Most people making these choices have never stepped foot inside of a prison, ever. And it's funny because I know it to be true, where you've got people advising the MDOC on their decision-making that have literally never stepped foot inside of a facility. They came straight out of college, put on a suit, and went straight to the top of an organization that they know nothing about. But they make these decisions, right? Darnell's video is very accurate when he says it's a capitalist environment. The phone system is privatized. There is a private company that gets to set the pricing however they choose. What's rough about that is you don't have another option. You don't get the choice to say whether or not you're going to call your kid. It's either you're going to spend the money to call your kid or you're not. So you don't have an option. Healthcare has been privatized within the prison setting. So instead of you getting the proper medication that you should get, you get whatever they decide to give you, whether it's the second or third labeled generic brand. But one thing for sure is you're not getting the appropriate medication. That's really hard to watch when you're looking at someone that you know to be suffering from some form of illness. And I'm looking at it up close and you're watching that person suffer. And it's all based on the monetary value of what his medication cost. <laughs> moment. Um, I met him during COVID when, he, when COVID was ravishing through the prisons and prisoners were calling. Um, and, and we could talk about this for a long, long time. Um, the main thing we want to do, again, is to help you to know that these are real people. They have value and you can make a difference. Um, I, I appreciate very much the partnership 
and support of this church and these people um, who I've known since I was 18 at this point, over 30 plus years now. Um, and I'm, I think that's the right math. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, think <that's> right. <laughs> I think that's the right math. And um, I'm very grateful um, for your time and attention. Um, again, his perspective on this goes deep. It's, it's absolute, it is concrete, and, and he can speak on it with, with great authority in ways that no, I just can't. I'm just here trying to help support the work. Um, if there are people that may have one or two questions that you would like to ask uh, myself or Ken, if we have time for that, I don't know. I think the hours, I don't have my phone on my watch. I see one. Terry? You made us very aware of what this is. Had you gone to the power brokers, those that have a little bit more power than individual, have you made them become aware? Are you, do you have a plan to do that? My plan, hopefully, um, that, that's one of the reasons why I, I, I chose. I chose to say yes to God for, to get the doctoral degree. Um, there are certain things that in life where you just have to have a certain license to get in the room and, and, and help make a difference in some way. So I'm hopeful that it will help to have the degree and that this work, the body of work, the media, will help to reach congregations and people like yourselves um, all over the country because it really is geared for people of faith and people of a certain moral compass. Um, my hope is that we will be able to get the support of uh, foundations and grants and such. And I've known from all of my past experience with nonprofit, that's gonna need to be the work of a board of directors, which I don't have. I'm one person that's trying to, I, the, the guy who, who made the phone call, I got three of those this week alone. And I record all of them. I, I could share an hour's worth of those. But what he speaks about, about people coming out and having nothing, those people were exonerated, freed, and they come back with nothing. I have some people who have served their term, and they still come back with nothing. We had three that have been uh, released just within the last two weeks. And, and Ken sent me a donation to help one of them. You know, so it's, it's like the poor helping the poor. And we're trying to make it work. Um, so I'm hopeful that some people who have the time and have the acumen to be able to, all right, take some of this. All right, I'm going to write this over to, and send it over to so-and-so to help get some of those type of things funded so that people like him can do this full time. He needs to be speaking and going across the country and crying loud and sparing not full time, because everyone can't say it like he says it, even if they live it and they feel it. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Mr. Nixon, you have given a wonderful example of how those who are exonerated are helping those who are being exonerated, and you are a 501c3 charitable organization, right? <laughs> Um, we are not currently. We have filed. We you're actually you're filing for that. We filed last week. Actually, we're waiting for the IRS. Yes. Um, when the when the when the video went through, it seemed to me I saw that if you'd like to contribute to Danielle's work, or and I don't know if that immediately goes to your work or. And just work together, sort of. Um, but it gave it gave, it gave your address, and but it, you know just went right on by. It, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't appear to be on this. Yeah. Is it on here? It's, yeah, it is. It is on here. It's so on the back of the program, and it, it, we are affiliated with a nonprofit who provides fiduciary covering for us. And, and that's the elite. Elite Community Growth Collective. So, so I can send a donation to Elite Community Growth Collective at 414 West Ridgeway Avenue, Flint, Michigan. Yes, ma'am. 
and, and, and however it's directed in the memo, if it needs to go to uh, this organization or to some, we work very closely together in that way. So yes. Okay, and 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 Mr. Nixon, what is your the name of your organization that you are making a five hundred one three C? Organization of Exonerees. Do you know of any other state that's doing this? I mean, you're doing a kind of mission. In fact, I don't know what MDOC stands for. Michigan Department of Corrections. Of Corrections. Ah, uh, but do you know if they're doing anything like this in Indiana or Illinois or? No, we no. are the only organization made in up. In the country? Uh, no. We are the only organization in the country that is entirely made up of exonerees. Our board of directors is exonerees. We operate solely and independently of any other organization. And this initiated from you within the year? Yes. Right? Yes. yes. Wow. Wonderful, wonderful work. Um, but now the Innocence Project, do we have one in Michigan that's just Michigan? We actually have two in Michigan. The, the difference between the Innocence Project and us, the Innocence Project is made up of legal scholars that do the legal work. We are not lawyers. We're just justice-impacted people that are trying to make a difference. Our job, our responsibility, um, first is to bring awareness. Every one of us spent time in prison for crimes that we didn't commit. And we've come together as a group to make sure that the world knows about it, to make sure that people understand that this can happen to you. We did nothing to deserve the injustice that was thrust upon us. It's not right. It's not fair. And we want the world to know about it. There has to be something done. There has to be some form of change. Are there any other questions? I know. Yes, ma'am. I'm just kind of curious if Brian Stevenson has brought a, a lot of this people's attention. I mean, is there any sort of organization? I mean, are you beginning to communicate with each other? You know, people are doing things in small little pockets. Yes. Um, initially, when we started, um, it was just us. But the momentum has begun to build and the progress has begun to make success stories. And what I mean by success stories is we've rattled enough cages where they're coming to us now. We don't have to go looking for Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson is looking for that group of guys from Michigan that was making noise out in Missouri now. So, so um, initially that wasn't the intention. We were just doing the right thing because it was the right thing to do. You, um, as Darnell knows, we were going out to Missouri to support an innocent person. Um, the court system was fighting him. We just showed up. We had no idea it would become a media frenzy. We were the guys from another state that were innocent, that were somewhere else in somebody else's territory, rattling cages. Every time we got a chance, we were in front of a camera. Every radio interview that came our way, we took it and we made a, as big a fuss as we possibly could about this innocent person sitting in a cage for a crime that he didn't commit. Unbeknownst to us, the entire country was watching us. We didn't know it, we didn't realize it, we had no intentions of it. We just wanted it to be known that there was an innocent guy in the cage. And next thing you know, we were getting phone calls from all over the country asking how people could help, what we could do. Reverend Levinston, yes sir, question, comment. <laughs> Wonderful job, first of all. Thank you. Thank you. This is great to be patient. And to be your friend, too. And I'm blessed to have you as a minister. My question goes to you, Darnell. Uh, you're beloved here. We've known you for a long time. How did you get this call to this kind of ministry? Maybe you said that earlier on. I don't know. But, uh, you know, this is not a mission to be able to think about one of these. It might be maybe we should. But I'm just saying, this is amazing. This is quite an amazing call. You know, I've, I've never considered the mission field. You know, when we grew up, we heard about missionaries, and we thought of, you know, hippies or seniors. <laughs> quite honestly, you know, hippies or seniors. And they were going across the country, you know, Birkenstocks. We thought, that's what we thought. Um, so it, 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 until it hit home, 
as he said. And it didn't actually hit my physical home, but it did hit my cultural and my, 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 my spiritual home. What do I mean by that? I grew up at the time when they were, where was the Save the Males. I don't know if you remember that in the 90s. This is a long time ago. Where there was, it was a campaign to save black males because we were, they were dying in huge numbers. It was said that we were becoming, uh, we, become, we would become extinct. So when I got to a certain age category, I was like, oh my goodness, I, I, I made it, I made it. Years later, the killings continue and black bodies are disappearing. Oh, well, where is so-and-so? I ain't seen him in a while. Oh, he's been gone for four months now. This, would happen, this happened at, for, to a young man at the church that I was serving in Flint, Michigan. And I'm like, well, are we ministering to him? Are we in contact with him? He's way up north. His mama can't even go visit him. Are we taking her to visit him is my questions. And, I'm, and, and so it started impacting me in a certain kind of way. Now, th there's a whole lot to it. I can talk about how my, my, my pastor, Bishop Flunder, she preached about how big will we make the table of welcome? Who's welcome? You know, and she said, are, are those who are incarcerated, are they welcome at the table? To what degree are they welcome? Are they tolerated? So as an LGBT identifying person who's been welcomed at a certain table, I'm like, well, how big do we make the table? We need to make, everybody needs to be welcome. So my heart became open to God, and I started listening to God. And God told me to, well, get, get on the JPay and start communicating. And I just started communicating and sending information that would be helpful to people. And then people started signing up. And so I'm like, okay, God, I thought I was going to be an opera singer. You know? <laughs> I thought I was going to travel the world and do opera. And it just turned into something that God is... is he needed somebody to do this, I think. So I'm just making myself available for however long he'd have me to do it, to whatever extent. And as soon as my replacement shows up, you know, I'm going to go sit on a beach in Kenya somewhere, okay? I hope that answers some of the questions. Uh, Beth, please. Hi, I'm Beth Ross, and thank you so much for your talk today. You know, I'm just wondering, you know, and um, so my question is, is what can churches do, what can faith communities do uh, as far as this abolition work? And I do want to put out a plug for this local aid. Uh, you and I went to uh, Sierra Valley Women's Correctional Facility yesterday, and we had a protest there. It was on uh, last month and this month, and we'll be going again next month. We want to put it as well. Um, but you can contact our officials. And we can tell them about the conditions that are going on right there. They're quite terrible to the women that are there. And this is something that we can do to make our table bigger. We can care about those people and the people that are leaving prison. And uh, I was, I've heard so many ideas today, and I would love for us to hear the sound and start talking about what we can do as a big community. Thank you. Um, I'll there's a hymn writer who wrote a song that talks about looking full into the face of God and not turning away and watching how your life becomes renewed and changed by continuing to look fully in the face of God. And I would ask that you would look fully into the face of this problem in every way that you can. Don't turn away from it. When you leave today, tell someone about it. When you leave today, Take this, there's some YouTube links. Go on YouTube, do the digital advocacy, and share the links. And tell somebody, hey, let's learn more. About, ask the questions, have the conversations. Because there is a myriad of ways that you can become involved to whatever extent you would avail yourself. To whatever extent you would avail yourself. I, I came across a statistic yesterday as I was writing my dissertative work that talked about of the every $100,000 that American Christians earn, 107 go to foreign mission. I'll say that statistic again. Of every $100,000 an American Christian earns, roughly $107 goes to foreign missions. 
And of that, only 1% goes to the unreached populations of the world. There are unreached populations right here in our prison systems. What can we do to help support that reach? So there, there, what, I, what I am developing within my work is to be able to post online so that there are very categorical pathways to get people involved, whether it's at a holistic church walk. I don't want to, I don't want to, things like having prison Sunday, where we actually talk about it and dig deep into it. Um, we talked about the, the church in Bungoma. Does it, does it, can it be a, a continuance, an actual relationship, so that it's actual support and not charity? Do we, do we, do we have a young man like this um, come again? Or maybe, I'm, I'm throwing things out there, do something online, or you know, make a video that we would post on our website. You ask a creative and all kinds of things will come to mind. But it's, what I'm trying to do is design it in such a way in which, all right, yes, I can plug and play into this. Oh, I can plug and play into that. There, was, huh. there are prisoners who just want to be able to call somebody and have them pray for them. There's a video online that I have about that. They just want to be able to call in and ask somebody to just pray. I actually set up one of those kind of a hotlines, we called it. And we, we operated that for like almost two months. So there are all kinds of ways. And I promise you, within the next 47 days, <laughs> it'll be posted on the website. Okay. Any other questions? I thank you for your endurance and patience, Barbara. Well, I'm wondering if you have um, in dating for us or anything about, I mean, I realize how it got. I feel about the prison system. I know what I do, I know what I hear doing. But um, I think when you talk about people making decisions that don't really know anything about the prison system, I think one one thing that makes it difficult to get involved is really you know, it's fenced in. It, it, I mean, it's not just fencing the prisoners in, it's fencing us out. And so, you know, the, the notion that um, you know, where do we start? Right. So, we so um, can talk about talking to people in positions of authority other than our political leaders. I wouldn't know where to start. What, going to Pastor Bob's question, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, changed my life. That was part of my turning point because I didn't realize that I was living in an era of. Jim Crow. My mama and grandmama talked about it, but when I read that book, it changed my life. I would say start with there. And then, and then again, check my website in about 40 more days, because even the book list is going to be there. It's going to be there. Well, that's what you put in the church board. <laughs> I'm going to leave that to church council. Um, Pastor Bob? <laughs> Hey, one more thing is, when we talk about this before, there are other churches that do it that create a relationship, a sister church relationship with the church as far away as Africa. And that might be a really cool thing for our congregation to think about. It's about having a special relationship or other kinds of relationships. But I think you're working now in Africa, and it's something that this church might consider. To officially become 501c3 status 
we have stepped into that space. We have stepped into that space as a group because we understand it. But a statement you just made, I want to make sure that I highlight just how much people don't know about what's happening. And, and the point that I want to make there is the Innocence Project has been keeping statistics on exoneration since 1989. Michigan has ranked in the top five for number of exonerations since 1989. We have had the highest number in the top five statistics slot of all the states. We have consistently exonerated more innocent people than almost all the other states. The raw, exactly. This is a fact. To answer the question that was asked a few minutes ago, what can you do? The Innocence Project website is a very good place to start. You don't have to just sit on the sidelines. You can volunteer for the Innocence Project. You can donate to the Innocence Project. You can get involved with some of the, pro the programs that they have going on. They have tons of educational material on their websites. They do tons of webinars about what's going on in the Innocence community. They, um, every year there's an Innocence Conference that people can participate in and learn and educate themselves. We have two Innocence Projects in Michigan that you can volunteer for. Um, and when I say volunteer, it can be something as simple as making copies. You can go in on Friday and donate an hour of your time making copies. You can go in on a Tuesday after work and donate your time, you know, stamping papers or whatever the situation may be. But there are opportunities to get involved. And for those that are interested, the Innocence Project would be a perfect place to start. We thank you again so very much for your time and your attention. Thank you. And, and we thank you very much for taking your time to come. And are so grateful that you're on the outside and able to spread what you know and share what you know and, and help us all. So thank you very much. And I can tell from the uh, wonderful interest today that um, we're going to be pursuing more um, chances to interact and learn more. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, everyone.